Um, so yeah, sorry for that delay. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, simulations of the Antarctic ice sheet uh, to the year 2300 using our ice sheet model called MOLLE. Uh, this is work that was supported by the DOE Office of Science using uh, resources from NERSC. So here we're looking at two maps of Antarctica. Um, on the left, I have the flow speed uh, for observations on a logarithmic color scale. So uh, ranging from centimeters to meters per year in the interior of the continent out to kilometers per year uh, towards the margins. And this black contour is what we call the grounding line, which is the point at which ice flowing towards the ocean goes afloat uh, on, on the ocean. So everything inside this contour is uh, ice that's resting on land and everything outside is floating on seawater. Uh, on the right, I have the ice thickness. Grounded ice thickness is in blue, so up to five kilometers thick towards the interior of the ice sheet. Um, and uh, all these floating um, regions we call ice shelves are in gray, so ice shelves range about up to two kilometers or a kilometer and a half thick. But if we strip all this ice away and look just at the, the land beneath Antarctica, uh, we see something really striking, which is that the bed of the Antarctic ice sheet uh, in large uh, large regions um, is kilometers below sea level and connected to the ocean uh, if that if the ice were to go away. And it's uh, in a very broad sense uh, deepening towards the interior of the ice sheet, especially in this region of West Antarctica. And this is problematic uh, in a warming world due to uh, an instability based on the physics of ice flow, known as the marine ice sheet instability. So in this cartoon, ice is flowing from left to right. It goes afloat at this, this vertical dash red line, which is the grounding line. Um, and it, it floats off into the ocean in this ice shelf, uh, which provides some stabilizing backstress that we call buttressing to the ice upstream. Uh, but ice flux at the grounding line is proportional to the ice thickness to a power of somewhere around five. So as the oceans warm, and melt this ice shelf and, and reduce the buttressing effect on upstream ice, uh, the grounding line will retreat into thicker ice, leading to a higher, uh, higher ice flux from the interior to the ocean, which causes acceleration and thinning of ice upstream, causing further grounding line retreat. And this is uh, positive feedback. Uh, this very likely contributed to large scale deglaciation of Antarctica in the geologic past, and it is very likely contributing to uh, sea level rise from Antarctica today. So looking at a map of present day changes based on satellite uh, observations of Antarctica, we see a large signal of this kind of thinning in West Antarctica, which is in this teal oval here, uh, where especially in the Amundsen Sea sector, uh, warm ocean waters are getting right up to the grounding line and under the ice shelves. Uh, and causing this dynamic and rapid drawdown of the West Antarctic ice sheet. And so looking at observations of mass change and equivalent sea level rise from Antarctica over the past three decades, we see that the contribution from West Antarctica in this, uh, this greenish teal um, are pretty much explain the, the entire uh, mass loss from Antarctica in purple here. And these observed changes uh, are on track with the highest mass loss projections from the, the uh, AR5 IPCC report a few years ago. Um, so what we're observing is, is consistent with large uh, sea level contribution from Antarctica over the next century. Which brings me to the, the present work, um, which is our contribution to an international uh, ice sheet model intercomparison project called ISMIP-6. This is sort of the second phase of ISMIP-6. Uh, the first phase went out to 2100, and the results from this are shown on the right. So this is many different ice sheet models using a handful of different uh, climate model forcings. And what they found is that at 2100, there's a huge intermodel spread, uh, There's and this, this spans zero. So even the sign of, of the sea level contribution from Antarctica by 2100 is uncertain. Um, but some interesting things are just starting to happen by 2100. And this is probably due to this huge amount of ocean warming shown in the bottom panel um, in the last few decades of the 21st century. And so they made the decision to 
run these global climate models out to the year 2300 um, and do another another round of ice sheet model simulations based on those uh, those climate forcings. So we're following the protocol set by ISMIP 6, which is 14 different uh, climate scenarios spanning five different climate models, uh, low and high emission scenarios, um, uh, repeat forcing from the, the end of the 21st century versus explicitly modeled forcing out to 2300, um, and, a small, and a subset of runs that use a parameterization for collapse of the floating ice shelves based on uh, surface melting. So um, melting on ice shelves can drive hydrofracture through the ice and rapid ice shelf breakup. This has been observed in Greenland and in a few places in the northern reaches of Antarctica. Um, and it's projected to be an important contribution uh, further south of these large ice shelves later in, this, uh, in, in, the, in the coming centuries. Uh, our ice sheet model, MOLLE, is a thermomechanically coupled 3D higher order ice sheet model. Um, we use a four to 20 kilometer variable resolution mesh covering the whole continent of Antarctica, which comprises 400,000 cells and five vertical layers. Uh, we use a high order approximation of Stokes flow coupled with sliding of ice over the ice sheet bed to solve for velocity uh, and thickness evolution. And uh, we've run this on multiple architectures, but uh, so we use 30 Perlmutter nodes or, Cori or 60 Cori nodes and uh, very ballpark number is 600 node hours per run, but this this varied by about a factor of five. Um, and we're using a semi-plastic rheology for the, to describe sliding over the ice bed. Um, we use a fixed calving front, meaning that iceberg calving will uh, prevent advance of these ice shelves into the ocean, but it won't drive retreat. And then we use community standard uh, parameterizations for melt of the ice at the ice ocean interface. So to initialize our model, we compiled observations uh, of the ice velocity uh, in the early 21st century shown on the right here. And then we solve a simultaneous inversion uh, for a for a basal friction field describing ice sliding on the left and then uh, an ice stiffness field as well that I'm not showing. Uh, and we obtain this modeled speed, which minimizes the misfit uh, to the observed speed as, as well as respecting the physics of ice flow and, and some regularization. Our control run uh, uses a, a static climatology forcing, so just present day climate over all 300 years of the simulation. Uh, we find a moderate model drift of about 0.2 millimeters sea level equivalent mass change per year, uh, so about 45 millimeters over the, the course of the simulation. Uh, this is about equal and opposite in magnitude to the observed mass change. Uh, so while it doesn't do a perfect job of describing the historical evolution, it's a, a fairly stable control configuration, especially when uh, we compare this against the large changes in the, the climate forced runs. So looking at the sea level uh, rise from our core ensemble of, of simulations, which span uh, relatively modest climate forcings to relatively strong climate forcings, uh, we see up to about two and a half meters of sea level rise from Antarctica by 2300, which is a huge amount, uh, much, much more larger than the contribution at 2100, which is on the order of tens of centimeters. Um, and just taking one example, example run the, the orange curve here on the right I'm showing it 2016 on top and 2300 on the bottom we see that we've completely lost these large ice shelves which are currently the size of Texas um, much of the interior of Western Antarctica has has uh, cap melted away capped off into the ocean um, and thus resulting in, in lots of sea level rise uh, and these just show the range of responses um, from two different simulations. So the blue curve, which gives us half a meter of sea level rise, is on top uh, compared to that that more uh, that stronger climate forcing on bottom. So the next tier of experiments used uh, used weaker climate forcings. So um, three runs that assumed late 21st century climate uh, constant through the 22nd and 23rd centuries. And then one run using um, that was actually run to 2300 with the climate model, but using a, a low emission scenario. And we find uh, 
one to two meters less sea level rise from from those um, versus our our primary ensemble. So so running the climate models up to 2300, even though they're very expensive, is really key to uh, predicting sea level rise. Now, finally, uh, this this last tier of the ensemble, uh, which is uh, using prescribed ice shelf collapse based on the surface melting uh, that's predicted by the climate models themselves um, and standardized to be applied to the ice sheet models by ISMIP 6. So here the timing of collapse is the color, uh, the color scare here and every model that participates uh, applies these masks um, to standardize this, this process. And when applying uh, hydrofracture driven ice shelf collapse, we get up to 3.7 meters of sea level rise by 2300, which is, is just a huge amount. Um, and that's a, a very large increase compared with, with our um, core tier one experiments. Um, and a major goal of the SIDAC project, uh, FANCY, that we're, um, we're hoping to achieve in the next few years is a much better representation of ice shelf hydrofracture, which is going to include improved or improved treatment of, of surface melting, um, which will require better atmosphere ice sheet coupling in our earth system model and improved fracture mechanics within the ice sheet model. And here's just an example of the impact of hydrofracture for one climate scenario. So without hydrofracture is on the left and with hydrofracture is on the right at 2300. And this leads to something like a tripling in mass loss. Uh, we've also been using this, this model configuration these climate forcings to do some sensitivity experiments of our own outside of the ISMIP-6 protocol. So this is a sensitivity experiment uh, for ice shelf melt, um, the sensitivity of ice shelf melt to ocean temperatures and salinity. Um, that's led by Alex Hager, who's a postdoc in our group. Um, and so he found that, that using the interquartile range of this uh, tuning parameter for ice shelf melt, uh, he found about a, a 15 to 40 percent um, difference with our with our baseline ensemble, which are the, the solid curves here. But maybe the most exciting thing here is that these are our first Molly production runs on GPU nodes. Um, so these are Perlmutter, 30 Perlmutter GPU nodes uh, run for, on average, uh, 20 wall clock hours, so about six, 600 node hours each. So this is a, a huge step forward for us. Uh, likewise, we've been looking at the uncertainty due to the physics of sliding over the glacier bed. We use the semi-plastic uh, bed rheology in shown in the solid curves here, but but the bed ranges from viscous to plastic. Uh, and so we found a, a, up to a 70% variation um, due to sliding relative to our baseline ensemble. Uh, finally, Holly Hahn, who's a postdoc in our group, has been working hard on coupling our ice sheet model to a global sea level model. Um, usually when we report amounts of sea level rise, we talk in, in um, global mean sea level rise, but sea level variations are, are very spatially, um, they vary widely over uh, space and time due to the, the gravitational uh, structure of the earth. And so coupling the sea level model to the ice sheet model uh, leads to a large reduction in, in mass loss um, due to these feedbacks. So this is this is ongoing work, but it's really promising and exciting. So to sum up, uh, mass loss from Antarctica and accompanying sea level rise is going to increase rapidly after 2100. And so it's a, it's a really good thing that we're looking past that 2100 time horizon. Uh, our core set of experiments predict up to two and a half meters of sea level rise, um, but uh, which, is, which is much larger than if we had assumed a late 21st century climate. Um, but in introducing uh, this ice shelf hydrofracture parameterization bumps up sea level rise by almost another two meters. So it's really important to pin down the physics involved there. Uh, the uncertainty in ice shelf melt and sliding uh, leads to differences from our baseline on the order of 10 to 70%. Uh, we have coupled ice sheet sea level simulations in progress. Um, finally, ISMIP 7 is in its planning stages with the goal of uh, coupling ice sheet models to global climate models rather than this one-way uh, forcing. So keep your eyes out for that in the coming years. And finally, 
like to acknowledge funding from the Office of Science and Computing Resources from NERSC in Los Alamos, and I'll take any questions. <laughs>